really important that we begin to change the mindset of young people to know that your vote counts. They don't understand that the legislative arm of government is actually a co-equal arm of government. We have an uh, incredible amount of potential. Whatever it is I was doing because of my personal DNA, it mm -hmm. had to be of an international standard. Which is what, seriously speaking, is all about. On the show today, I have an interesting one-hour conversation, but I've broken it in two. You know how it is, you start a conversation and you don't have enough time to finish it up. This is somebody I had pursued for a long time, simply because she's not one person that you are ambivalent about. You either love her or you hate her. However, when she became the champion for the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, a lot of people just didn't wonder, what is in it for her? That's what they wondered. So let me introduce you to Obieze Kwisili. She's a chartered accountant, and she's a co-founder of Transparency International. She served as a federal minister of solid minerals and also education during the second term presidency of General Lucia Gumabasa until retired. Since then, she has served as vice president of the World Bank's Africa Division. That was between 2007 and 2012. In recent times, she's been advising a lot of African governments on economic matters. However, she remains the champion for the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. Well, I apologize that I'm not wearing my badge today. By the time I finished having my conversation with her, I became a strong advocate of the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, even though, as at the time of our recording then, 21 girls had been relieved, had been released to the relief of everybody who was involved. But it was a very emotional one-hour interview for me, especially because at the end of the day, I had the privilege of going to see the people who have been campaigning for the girls to be found. I present to you my two-part interview with Obi Ezekwisili. Welcome, madam, to Seriously Speaking. Thank you, Adeswa. I'm very glad to have you, you know. <laughs> I've wanted to have you on this show for the past maybe 12 months. And you're one of the reasons I said, I'm going to record this show in Abuja. Just find out when is she going to be there. Find us time and we'll record it. So I'm really very glad to be with you. I must say that um, I am glad that we're able to do this now. And well done. You've done so much in terms of um, issues that concern women and society in general. Mm -hmm. The thing about wh why, why I wanted to speak with you is I sit down, I've interviewed before, you know, on Today's Woman, on One on One in the past, and I've spoken for me. I come out inspired by the level of knowledge you have on any topic you have to talk about, more than anything else, that you have absolutely control and total control of what you're talking about. And then for the past one year or so, I've had you agitate, more than one year, agitate for the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. And I'm like, wow, I've never seen anybody that's been so abused on social media, but has refused to leave the social media. So tell me about how your journey into the campaign started. Well, you know, our Chiba girls were abducted on the midnight, um, the, on the 14th of um, April, midnight of the 14th April, uh, 2014. Um, it was on the 15th afternoon that the news broke, yeah. and I saw it on my timeline, because I do follow BBC. And when I saw that news saying, more than 100 girls abducted from a secondary school in Bruno, Nigeria, I thought, no, this cannot possibly happen. I'm sorry, you know, what's this? And so I retweeted that with, a question saying, are you, is this verified? And after I'd done that, then I waited and I said, wait a minute, it's BBC. BBC has quality control. So it would be very difficult for BBC to have put up the story. And as simultaneously as um, I was thinking that and getting really agitated that it actually might be true, I began to get responses. To Where were you at that point tweet. in time? I was actually, I was... Because you were still I, I, abroad. I was, I was in between countries. No, I was, <laughs> you know, because I, I was working with, um, I was, I, 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 I was, um, I had just finished an assignment in Guinea Conakry and heading home. And, and so for me, it was, um, it was a shocking piece of news. And I decided that I was not going to step away from it. I was going to probe and probe on what was being done uh, about that story. Uh, the reason that I made that decision was that two months before that particular um, episode, 
There had been the killing of yeah. the of the school boys in a federal government college, Boniyadi, a school that I knew very well as Minister of Education. As a federal government college, it had been one of the weakest ones. And so when we were trying to reform the uh, federal government colleges, we were going to, it was to be twinned with uh, the um, King's College. So King's College old boys were to run their school mm -hmm. as a school management organization. And because they would get that particular right, they were going to support directly the federal school. government college, Boni Yadi, as a weaker federal government well, college. You married them. So that's twin, <laughs> you know? So when those boys were slaughtered and then burnt, and the recordings put on the so internet, mm -hmm. I thought, I, I started speaking about it. And I said the federal government needed to demonstrate to the uh, terrorists, that this is a turning point in this war. You can't do this to our children. No, you can't, you can't get away with this. So I was very agitated at that time and I made sure to be vocal about it, to say, do something, show a signal, don't let them get away with this. But nothing happened. Rather, what happened was that we celebrated centenary and invited the world within the period that 29 children had been slaughtered and their shared remains were being tossed around. I was so devastated. And I said to my husband after a few days of being on the issue, I sound like I'm just crazy. No, you know, th this hasn't made any difference to, to the actions of, of the government. And, um, you know, and my husband said, baby, you've tried, you know. And, um, and I moved on too, but I moved on very pained. I was pained because I, I thought to myself, this kind of behavior is not right. We, the signals are important. When you send signals that um, create a basis for worse behavior, you need to be very careful. And so when our Chibo Girls episode came, that tragedy, occurred, and I began to uh, talk about it from that 15th, it became the only issue I was talking about on my timeline. I don't even know that whether mm -hmm. many people remember that mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, between the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, 20th weekend, the, 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 the military uh, then came out and said something about, oh, some girls were taken, but we've, um, we found majority of them. And I rejoiced. Even the young ones on social media said, Auntie, why are you rejoicing? Who told you it's true? <laughs> wow. I said, oh my God, is our society so broken that our young ones wouldn't even believe the military? Oh, so. I scolded them. I said, look, you can be, you can be very, um, you, you, you can be very um, uh, cynical, but please don't let the cynicism get to the point where you don't believe the mo very important piece yeah. of institution in your country. But they won. Because at the end of the day, it, it turned out to be a ruse that the girls were not found. Mm -hmm. And after a while, the military then said, oh, you know, there are 85 girls that were actually taken from that school. So I started a hashtag saying, where are our 85 daughters? And I used that hashtag to throw at every government <laughs> timeline that I could find, you know, that I could find. And the media. The local media was silent, not a word. I couldn't pick anything to read about Chibo girls in the mainstream media at that time. So all of these then culminated uh, uh, into a daily focus on getting us to speak about, get the government to say something about the girls. Why was there quiet? Why was there ominous silence about them? Until the 23rd, I went to um, the World Book Capital uh, event, which mm -hmm. was being laid on as a result of the work that um, a mentee of mine, uh, Coco Kalango, Coco, yeah. um, I chaired the, uh, the um, Rainbow Book Club Board of Trustees. Oh, okay. uh, so I was co-host, co-chair of, of the event where Port Harcourt was going to be the inaugurated as the World Book Capital, a major event, a book event. And so I had said to Coco that, look, we're going to have to use this event to call attention 
of the world to the fact that these girls that were taken are still missing and there's still no word on them. And so we agreed that incidentally or not even providentially. Mm -hmm, no like. Providentially, um, uh, Professor Wale Shoinka was the speaker, keynote speaker at the event. And when Professor Wale Shoinka began his speech, he spoke on knowledge, civilization, terrorism, books, and ended up on Chibokels. And I turned to Coco, Coco turned to me and we said, oh my God, this is providential. So after Prof spoke, and in his speech, he referred to the fact that there had been a program that he had done with the then president called Bring Back Our Books. Oh. Or Bring Back Our Book or something mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, that. Yeah. You know? So when Coco and myself then went up, we, I, I spoke. It's actually it's a video on, uh, on uh, the channel's television. You know? And I spoke and I said I, that we're calling on the entire people in the hall to rise in solidarity with girls who went to school and for nearly two weeks now, no word on them. So we that's the birth of the brain. Precisely. Back the, we girls. must tell the, our government to go after these people and rescue these girls. It took quite a job to get them in school in the first place, in a place like Bronu State, the Northeast Nigeria, where as Minister of Education, the issue of girls' education had been priority for me, and we wanted to achieve parity in education. And so it, we shouldn't ignore the tragedy and that we needed to show that solidarity. So I asked everyone, including the former um, head of state, um, um, I think um, Abdul Salami, who was uh, in the audience guess. as the chair of the event. I said, everybody stand and let us call out to, to our government and say, bring back all our daughters. And the young man who was listening to me at home tweeted and said, and B says, join and say, bring back our daughters, bring back our girls. And I retweeted him and told everybody to adopt that call and to begin to call out, bring back our girls. So inadvertently, that was the beginning of that the whole was the journey. Beginning. So I'll take a break now so I can take a commercial break. And I'll come back to try and get from you how much you know that the rest of us don't know about the Chibok girls issue. I'll be right back in a short while with Mrs. Ezekwisili, if you don't go away.